Welcome to the Leeds Edutainment Podcast, featuring in-depth interviews with people in hip-hop culture, based out of New England. How we doing, brother? Excellent, man. How you been? Good, good, good. Hanging in there. No doubt. Word. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Leeds Edutainment Podcast. Check us out on YouTube and all your digital streaming platforms. Give us a like, give us a comment, whatever you can do. It helps us out. we got a very special guest today, uh, rapper. Well, you know, when I met him, he was just a rapper, but now he's a jack of all trades. <laughs> he's a rapper. He's a radio personality. He's a business president. <laughs> we'll explain more. Mr. Torre, how are you doing? I'm great, man. How you been? Good, man, you know. Just like you try to, you know, navigate the waters of the music business. It's no changing doubt. No constantly. Doubt. It's funny. You said when I met him, he was just a rapper. Yeah, I was, you know, uh, I picked up a couple of other trades in that time, you know, since we first connected. Got to, man. You got to in this business, I'm finding. You know, more hustles, the better. No doubt. Multiple we'll streams. That. They call it multiple, multiple streams. Yeah. Don't let one thing have its foot on your neck. That's what I right. That's facts. Uh, That's facts. We'll get into that, but I want to go back. I always go back. Uh, Coney Island resident? Yeah, Coney Island, Brooklyn, New York. Yeah, so what? Grew up in the amusement parks? I mean, how, how was that like? <laughs> uh, so, you know, most people know Coney Island, yes, for the amusement park and the beach and the aquarium and all of the cool uh, tourist attractions. But if you venture down three or four blocks, you into the projects, uh, Carrie Garden's projects, Coney Island houses, all under NYCHA, you know. Uh, so basically, if you've been to any hood, anywhere in the world, it's no different. You just had a better backdrop. Yeah, because I someone mentioned that to me once. He's like, yeah, Coney Island, is, is it's got to share the projects. So I never knew it as that. And, yeah, um, most people, you they don't know much past, you know, like all of the tourist attraction stuff, Nathan's and, you know, the Cyclone and all of that. But yeah, the projects, the pro- a, lot, a lot of projects in Coney Island. So you decided it would be better to go the rapping route than hot dog eating champion route? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely didn't want to be the glizzy, the glizzy champion of the world, even back then. We have, we have a joke out here because the, the, the champion there, Joey Chestnut, you know who that is? Yeah, of course. He, he looks just like Esoteric from 7 Island Esoteric out here. <laughs> so, eh. Really, every time it's Esoteric's birthday, I'm just like, yo, I post a picture of Joey Chestnut wishing him like, you know, <laughs> that's, happy birthday. That's, that's what friends are for. That is definitely yeah, what friends yeah. are for. Especially industry friends. Facts. So would you start getting rap? How, how'd you get, obviously you're in New York, so you're in the middle of hip hop Mecca, but like, mm-hmm. how did the rapping start? And how did it all, how'd you participate? It just happened. It just started. You know, um, I came up in the 90s, right? Late 80s, 90s. So hip hop was all around me. Like, even as we celebrate 50 years of hip hop this year, I don't know a time in music without hip hop existing. I've seen it change. I remember having to wait until the end of the night to hear a rap song or to have to wait for mix shows to come on to hear rap, whereas now you can hear it 24 seven. But for me, it was just everything that I thought was cool. It was the way that the homies dressed outside. It was the cars that the rappers drove. It was the sound of the music. It was the conversation in the music. All of it spoke to me, it spoke for me. And so I just was naturally drawn to it. It was a very innate thing for me just to want to pursue it. And MCing was, I guess, the lowest hanging fruit in the fact that I didn't need much to do it. I just needed my mind and a pen and a pad. You know, like if you wanted to DJ, you needed to have some equipment. If you wanted to produce, you needed equipment. So um, even if you wanted to do graffiti, you had to get some cans and spray paint, right? So for me, it was like, I could write rhymes in my composition notebook, or if I don't have one, I could write them on the back of a brown paper bag. But that was the easiest way for me to begin to express myself in this culture. And then I just figured out ways to cultivate it and and be great. Yeah. So I didn't realize this because I met you like right when you dropped your first album. And um, but I didn't realize the backstory for you before that. You were you submitted your demo to Bad Boy. Is that what happened? Uh, I mean, you know, that was when you were trying to get on. That's all <laughs> we knew at one point. It was like um, make a demo tape and figure out how to get it to labels. And so um, for me, reading album credits and reading line of notes and seeing addresses. Yeah, I went up to Bad Boy. 
I don't know if I sent it in or if I if I brought it in there, but I think I sent it. No, maybe I dropped it off. Uh, but yeah, Rockefeller, Bad Boy, um, whatever label had an address, whatever label had a, a physical place for me to pull up to, I was there dropping off my demo tape and actually got a call back from Bad Boy, which was, that's probably why it's part of the story. Yeah, yeah. So, so they liked the demo. Yep. So it was a guy, it's crazy that I remember this. I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. Come on. Can you, don't remember your, you don't remember your, someone liking your demo at Bad Boy? Right. It was a guy named <laughs> Slick Love. And um, yeah, he called back. He was like, yo, I heard your tape. I think it's dope. I want to meet with you. And so I was like, bet. I was like, oh, this is this is pretty easy, right? And so I went up to Bad Boy. Um, obviously, like just to fast forward through the story, Slick wasn't an executive there, but he was part of the street team. And so what that opportunity allowed was for me to spend a lot of time at the label, go to different video shoots and video sets and meet some people in the business that, you know, I ended up building relationships with in the future. What year was this? Damn, I could. Well, I could tell you. Hold on. Let me see. I would have to do a Google, but if you bear with me, I'm going to tell be like you. It's 2000, isn't it? 2000? I went 2000? to, when did the, the 112 Only You remix come out? You got me on that one. Not, not. I remember <laughs> that. I, I remember be, because I can timestamp it because I was at that video shoot. I was at that what? video shoot and I was around the time that I was running around with the guys from Bad Boy. So it was released in 96. It was released in 96. So yeah, this was like 95, 96. Wow. Because at that video shoot, I was invited by the guy Slick Love. Um, but Big was still alive. Obviously, he was on the song and that was the first time I ever saw Big in person was at that video shoot. And obviously, we know he passed in 97. So um, yeah, so that was around 90, 96. Damn. Crazy. From here, yeah. So how old were you? you know, was, <laughs> um, in 96, I was 18. Wow. Impressive. Yeah. Impressive. Word. Um, From here, you also, uh, you get on the Rough Riders Cash Money Tour later on from, you know, a couple of years later, correct? Right, 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 right. Now, so see, that this was is crazy. This is I got to stop you real quick because I know you as like a hardcore, like boom bap, like, you know what I mean, underground rapper. But you're rolling with some commercial, some, some crazy commercial stuff at this point. Well, bad boy, yes. I think the Rough Riders thing was definitely more in vain because you're thinking about the locks, you're thinking about DMX at that time. Although they had mass appeal, you know, and bigger success, I think at yeah. the, the core of the music was still very street oriented. Um, but the way that happened was just being at the concert. I actually was at the Rough Riders Cash Money concert. And um, during intermission, they asked if anybody knew how to rap. And somebody went up and they were terrible. And I think maybe somebody else went up and they were bad. And I was like, you know, we had really good seats. We was on the floor. And so I was like, yo, I can make my way up to the stage. And I went up and I rapped and standing ovation. And everybody came out like from the back to see what was going on. And so it was a dope experience. 20,000 people. Decent amount. <laughs> Decent amount for the coming out party. That uh, beats uh, Middle East upstairs, you know, 200 capacity. I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll do it right now. I will go upstairs in the Middle East and tear Let's it down. Do it. I feel you. The first, you put out your first 12 inch. It was Give Me the Mic and was it Spice Thing? Is that what it is? That was the yep. 12 inch? Yep. Was, I, I don't think I heard these records, that, that 12 inch. What was the sound on that? Nobody did. Nobody, nobody heard it. it was it nobody <laughs> heard it. okay that was that was you know i thought that in order to get on in order to get her back in that time you had to have vinyl because the djs broke artists right and so in right. order for you to get it into the hands of the dj they weren't taking cds i mean obviously they wasn't playing cassettes right or so i didn't know that and so <clears throat> for me i was like the only way to get to the djs and to get heard was to get some vinyl. And so I like, I got a credit card. I maxed it out, pressing that up. I went through like disc makers to press that up. I don't even think it was mixed or mastered. I just was very, very uh, young in the business. I was very green. And so I made a lot of rookie mistakes, but you know, it's all part of the story. So yeah, we pressed that up. So Spice Thing was like the street record. That was the B side. And Give Me the Mic, was the single so it sampled uh george benson's give me the night um also borrowed you know the chorus and so that was the that was the premise and the thought behind that creation of that record 
And then, of course, my street single was a little more geared to the street. Yeah. And no one heard it, you said? <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I, you know, funny enough, like some years ago on, on YouTube, somebody had found, like, I don't know if they found like an old dat or demo or whatever, but they found some old Torre demo music that I was I was going by Spice at the time. I wasn't even using my oh. government name. And they were able to connect that Spice was Torre and they put it up on YouTube and it was really crazy to hear all those years later. Uh, but yeah, give me the Mike and Spice thing. You know, outside of locally, my community, Coney Allen heard it. Um, I think I had some I had some of the vinyl maybe sitting in Beach Street, downtown Brooklyn. But some people might have heard it from that, but it definitely didn't like take off like I thought it would. Yeah. You also align yourself with Dipset too, correct? Yep. And Cameron, talk about that, how that all happened. Because again, these are all things I just found out within the last few hours. <laughs> <laughs> it was that, I had no idea happened, about this about you. <laughs> that happened very um haphazardly. So without getting into the longest of the long story, I was on a video set for camera i was cast in the video cameron was one of my favorite <laughs> rappers which is the only reason why i even agreed to be in the music video um but i was i was cast in the music video as like a boxer or a street fighter and during the scene of my taping a dog one of the pit bulls that was on set got loose and kind of like lunged at me it bit through my pants it like caught a little bit of skin and so i had to go get like a tetanus shot and all of that anyway the label was super concerned and cam was actually concerned. He's like, yo, homie, you good? You straight? I was like, nah, I got to go get this shit out. I'm mad I'm missing the video. He was like, nah, don't worry about it. Take my number. We shooting again tomorrow, day two. Just hit me and pull up. And so from then on, I was pulling up every day for like two years. Wow. So, yeah. were, you, so were you just rolling with Dipset back then? Yeah, it was even before they were like, the dip set, right? It was diplomats. Right. It was it was early. Yeah. It was in between Cam working or finishing up his first album oh, um okay. and, and going into the SDE album. And so I was just around during all of that. And even from SDE into his trans uh you know transition into Rockefeller and under that fold. So I was around for those years. But yeah, we spent a lot of time doing shows and spot dates and I was traveling with them and I had a car so I was transporting. We was moving around. It was definitely, um, it was definitely a time, as the kids say. Yeah, shout out, shout out, Cameron. I mean, I've done, I've done many Cameron solo shows at the Middle East. Word. Yeah, Cam my... and Jewels and Jim and Zeke. You know, all of those guys showed me nothing but love back at the time. You got any wild stories from back in those days? You could tons, talk about? tons of yeah. them. <laughs> Give me one good one. Give me one good one. Oh God, uh, a good one. So I will leave out names to protect the guilty. Yeah. But um, yeah, for sure, Cam got booked. Cam got booked for a show. We traveled to the show. You know, he got his he got his deposit, and we were waiting like in the Sprinter or the van or whatever for Cam to get his second half, and then we was gonna go in and do the show. And said promoter who was famous didn't have his money, and so Cam was like, you know, trying to decide. All right, well, we here. Do I do the show? Or whatever, whatever. He, he talked to another famous rapper who's a podcaster now. And that rapper actually got paid. He got his second half. And so Kim was like, oh, Duke is trying to play me? And so it just turned into a lot more than just performing uh, a set. I'll say that. Yeah, At some yeah, point, I... there was a there was a, 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 a almost kidnapped. Well, uh, I always paid Cam, so I, it's not me. <laughs> which is why, which is why you were not almost and simply kidnapped. This is exactly why. Um, I will tell you a funny Jim Jones story. Uh, I did a Jim Jones show when he was doing. I'm sure you've heard plenty of these Jim Jones stories in your career. Uh, we were doing Vampire Life Tour. Remember, he was doing that whole vampire thing. Mm -hmm. so we did a show here at the Middle East, and he came through, and he did maybe two songs, and someone threw a, a red solo cup on stage, and he instigated a whole riot. <laughs> Sounds about right. The thing is, the Middle East doesn't even serve red solo cups. So there's this whole conspiracy theory of how the solo cup got in. <laughs> Was it staged? <laughs> we don't know. But one of the worst events I've ever thrown in my life. That's a bold statement. That but, is uh, crazy. We yeah. we we spent a lot of time fighting our way out of venues when during my time with the dipset. 
I think that says it all right there. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, great times. Great times. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm glad you learned what not to do. Um, you have been quoted as saying, Redef Torre redefines the word grind. I'm guessing that's because you work extremely hard and I've seen you and you do work hard. Talk to me about the mentality behind the grind. Um, I mean, I guess it's just something that you kind of born with. Either you have it or you don't. Nobody can really motivate you to do the things that you need to do. Either you're going to do it or you're not. I'm, I'm one of those guys that no matter what I got going on, I'm going to give it 110%. If I'm working at McDonald's, I'm going to make the best burgers. If I'm making a song in a studio, I'm going to try to make the best music. So that's just who I am. Um, it's very innate. And as far as just all of the different platforms and ways I express that, those things just came out of necessity, you know, um, putting out my own music and deciding to be independent and learning how to speak to promoters and, and act as my own booking agent and act as my own travel agent, you know, and, and a and R my own projects and even moving into doing radio and television and acting and things of that nature, all those things happen because there was nobody else there to do it for me. So I had to learn, you know, I really had to open up my mind to, to open up a different level of engagement and open up a different level of ways to continue to put myself out there. You know, when you, when you're not on a major label and there's no big marketing budget out there to blow you up, you got to figure out ways to keep, your name and people's mouths pause and and get into the ears of those people pause that you never met before. And so it's just about figuring out ways to do that. And, and I think I've been able to do a good job at it. Is this a mentality you learned or was it you trained? Like did you have good influences in your life that gave you this work ethic? Um, I'm, I'm a self-starter. I think I looked to my left and my right. Like I was talking recently that my granddad owned a bunch of nightclubs in Harlem, right? And wow. so- that's probably a little bit of my entrepreneurial spirit. And my dad would DJ at those clubs and I grew up with turntables in my house and vinyl. And so I think that that definitely was part of my, my musical interest and even performing, right? Like learning songs. And, and when my mom had company and my parents had company be coming out and rapping as a little kid, I think all of those things kind of lent themselves to who I would become. But, you know, as far as like getting to it, Nobody got to tell me to get to it. I'm going to go get up and get it. Right. You did an ad for LeBron James. Man, this is, I don't know. You got, you got like the first bio, but it's all good. You're I do. Because the first, the first bio is, is excellent. There's all this yeah, backstory. Yeah, this is, I learned everything of you on the backstory. This is super taping. Take this is back. all stuff. All, everything I'm talking about is before I knew you. So this is uh -huh. why I'm enjoying this. Yeah. It's, it's all part of like, Funny enough, somebody was like, yo, you hit 2023 going crazy. Like, you, your grind is crazy. And I'm like, <laughs> it's literally always been like this. It's, right. it's more, I think it's more publicized because of social media, because somebody could pick up their phone and see what I'm doing or scroll right. through a month of my life. Like, holy shit. But it's literally from day one, you know, right. it's, it's who I am and who I've been. So the LeBron James thing came. Um, shout out to... I don't know what they call, but I'm calling them the Justice League. I'm talking about Little Brother yeah. and Ninth Wonder and Crisis and Doe and and, and right. Sean Dawn and you know away right. team and right just out. So Doe had an opportunity with Nike and LeBron James, and um, I don't know all of the business on it. It was an opportunity that they presented to me. It was like, yo, we doing this commercial for LeBron James. Crisis doing the music. You want to rap on it? I was like, absolutely. And so um, that's his, that's the extent of of it. But I saw a clip when it came out and all of that. It was dope. And yeah, man, it was just another another great opportunity to like kind of put in the building blocks of, of who I've become. Yeah. So moving forward from that, which is which is crazy. I mean, you think about it, now you got Dipset, Bad Boy, you're on tour with all the Cash Money or Upriders. LeBron James ad, and then and, and now, and this is what next up. I'm thinking like this is where I discover you is when you drop the daily conversation out. Okay, right, yeah, like that was my we we call that the breakthrough mixtape. It was a mixtape, but it feels like an album. I mean, it was probably right. on mixtape form. That's why you called it a mixtape, right? Yeah, yeah. And before that, obviously, before you dropped that, actually, I think I heard of you 
because you in Sky Zoo did the primo joint. Right. Talk to me about how that happened too. Talk to me about because you link up on this first album, the big two main producers is Premier and Marco Polo, right? On on Daily Conversation. Yep. Talk to me about meeting those guys and how that all happened. Um Primo, so Prem had we had mutual friends. Um I was in a group, right? After my solo endeavor, before I went solo again for a, a small window, I was in a group called a Coalescence uh, with myself, DJ Vega Benetton, producer Wally Sway, and my longtime brother, Kill Ripken, who I'm still brothers with to this day. Yeah, I know Kill Ripken. Yeah, Kill, we, so we all, we all came together. We coalesced, right? We made this group and we had a 12 inch pause called Promises. And Prem would play the record. Prem would play the record. Him and Vega were connected. Vega Benetton, the DJ, they were connected. I was connected to through another mutual friend. And so Prem would play the record. Prem came out one day to see us perform. And as legend has it, was fell in love with my performance and just all of that. And was like, y'all want to work with dude. Um, fast forward through that. One day I get the call. Yo, Prem want you to come to the studio. And so when we went to the studio, Sky and I had already worked on some music together. We had already been acquaintances. Um, the call went from Prem want you to come to the studio to would you be cool to do the record with Sky Zoo because he wants to work with him as well. And so I was like, yeah, I'm cool with Sky. We already got records. Let's do it. So that turns into us going to studio together, making click and get it done. And then those records really both catapulting us to the next levels of our career. That's, that's the Prem part. Yeah, that's the Prem part. Marco happened through Emilio Rojas, who might have even been Rax One back then. Um, I know Emilio Rojas, yep. Quite familiar with Emilio Rojas out there. Yeah, Emilio and I were super cool. We lived like 20 minutes from each other. And so I would go to his place to record. And, you know, we would run the streets and kind of run the circuit. And one day, <clears throat> he's like, yo, I'm going to link up with the producer, Marco Polo. You want to roll? And I was like, yeah, Marco is dope. He got some beats I heard, whatever, whatever. And so we went through, Marco was actually, he had finalized the first Port Authority album, but it wasn't out yet. And so anybody who had a set of ears, he was playing it for and getting feedback. And when I heard that album, I was like, wow, this guy is, this guy is something special. You know, the, the caliber artist that he selected for that album, the way he was yeah. able to make these incredible records, the fact that it was coming out on Raucous, like it was just so many cool parts of it. Um, but Marco and I became fast friends, fast forward to brothers, and we still brothers to this day. And you guys made the first, your other, your next collaborative album, Double Barrel. Yes, we did. Uh, we did Double Barrel in 09. We released it on Duck Down. But even before that, Master Ace um, had took took us both on tour together. So Marco and I toured first Canada with Moss and Addict and EMC, and then Europe for like 30 dates with EMC and Ace, even before they were EMC. And, you know, we were the open act. So we had to share a room. We had to sit next to each other on the bus, like all of that shit. And we just like bonded. We super bonded. And once that tour was over, we was like, yo, we need to do some shit together. And we went in the studio and we cooked up. Yeah. And now Marco Polo is pretty much Master Ace's DJ. I mean, that's the package now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, those get, guys. It's it's Ace and Polo. You're not getting Ace it, without Polo. That's it. That's it. They 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 are definitely a package deal. Yeah, and you work and you. So the the list the list goes on of people you work with. We got Eric G, Black Milk, Ninth Wonder, Crisis, Large Pro, Pete Rock, obviously DJ Premier, and then MC Shaw, Stimuli, Tash, Teflon, Sean Don, Sean Price, Master Ace, Wale, Talib Kweli. Did I forget any? That was so like that's so long ago. Yeah, I've definitely worked with tons of other artists since then. Oh, but you who know am what I'm forgetting? Um, <laughs> shit. Who are we forgetting? Uh who are you forgetting? Styles P. We got we got Styles P. We got Freeway. We got Tedra Moses. We got Saul Williams. We got Mac oh, Wiles. Yeah, oh. we got Lil Brother, Fonte, Solo, and Lil Brother. We got 3D Not T. We got minute, is that the new is that the new album you just held up there? This is the this is the oh. last this is the oh, last, the last one. One. title. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, who's on here? Uh Mila Machinko is on here. Who's on this one? These gotta go to the post office, which is why they're sitting here. Guilty okay, nice. Simpson, Guilty Simpson, Black Milk, uh Blue. Yeah, we, oh. we uh 
some good. You might want to update. Good. You might want to update that bio because those are some good <laughs> names. Oh, I'm just gonna yell at the team when we get off this call. I'm gonna yell at them like, "Yo, what did y'all send?" Well, I dug up the early stuff. They saw the the, the newer stuff is more them. Um, I, you said you're selling, you're moving CDs. You're still selling CDs. Is there still good money? In that? I heard there is. It's for me. It's just you know connecting with the people. They they want a physical, tangible something right. that they can hold on to. Um, so I open them. I ask them before we sell them out. Like I still use my band camp and. Once we get like maybe 15, 20 orders on the band camp, then I'll just reach out like, yo, you want the sign? And if so, I crack it open. I hit it with the Sharpie and I send it off. And, um, you know, it's just a way for me to stay tapped in with my with my base. I'm going on to do a bunch of other things, but I know that the catalyst for it all was me being a recording artist. And the people who kept my lights on for a number of years were the people who showed up to the shows and bought merch and copies, physical products. So... I like to still continue to to serve that audience and that population for sure. The, even a new album with Marco, we got cassettes, CDs, and vinyl. Dope. Yeah, that's great. I mean, a lot of people think it's a dead selling thing, but I, the more research I'm doing is like, people are still selling them, making a little bit of cash. And I mean, it's not my, not crazy amounts, but it's something. We talked about yeah, multiple, re sure. multiple revenue streams, you know, and maybe a little bit helps. It's all like for that. That's to me. That's passive because it's 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 it. It costs so little to do it, and just to give people again something special. You know, even when you do shows, even if they just came for the show, even if they got it on their phone, they're like, oh fuck it, fifteen dollars, sign the CD for me. You know what I'm saying? So again, yeah. it's just 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 ways to tap in and connect with your audience. It's great. From here, obviously, you you put out numerous albums. You mm -hmm. know, we just we just read off a couple here. Um, and then you decide you're going to, you're going to pivot, right? Like after all these years, of albums and doing the whole rapping thing, you decide to pivot. Um, you pivot into being a songwriter, an actor, a radio host. You do, now you have a podcast, you're president of the recording Academy. I, I want to take, talk about each one, but what was the first pivot? What was the first pivot you think you made? The first pivot was definitely like career wise was radio. Right. And that was, who's that guy back there? That's my dog. That's Guru. Guru. He just, guru. He just walked. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I saw you had something in the back too. What do you have, a cat? Yeah, that's a cat. That's my, that's my daughter's yeah. cat. I um, saw him. I saw her. I saw it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She, Jenna. She's somewhere around here. Jenna. Thing. Um, radio happened through, I'm sure somebody that you know, DJ Eclipse, nonfiction, oh, yeah. rock steady. Eclipse because of just his pedigree and, and how much he had helped me in my career, you know, from me being on NYU halftime show to me being on Rappers Out of Control to him putting some of those earlier vinyls in fat beats on consignment and just, he was so instrumental in, in aspects of my career that when he asked me to join him on radio, although I was hesitant and probably reluctant, I didn't flat out say no because I felt like I owed at least a chance to try it for Eclipse because that's my guy like that. And I ended up enjoying it. I ended up doing radio. You know, I was trying to, in my mind, balance how are you going to be a radio host and a rapper. And then I was like, well, Sirius XM has millions of subscribers. Those are millions of people that could potentially hear you and millions of people that could potentially tap into your music, hundreds, thousands, whatever, right? But I looked at it kind of like as a label. I was like, well... If I'm in the building and I don't know, Red Man walks through the building, maybe I could talk to Red Man, right? And if there's no big market and promotion budget, but these people are going to tune in and listen to music, even if they tune in to hear Nicki Minaj, maybe they hear me after that and are like, oh, well, I like this too. So for me, I looked at it as an opportunity for one, to help my brother, DJ Eclipse, because he asked me. And for two, it was like a strategic, well, how do I continue to build the Torre brand without using the, the, the traditional outlets and places to do it? So you were you just on Sirius? What, did you just do one station? What, did, what, what, what were the details? So as it started, so DJ Eclipse had a show, has a show called Rappers Out of Control that he does now yeah. with DJ Riz, yeah. right? So I started on Rappers Out of Control Sunday nights, 10 to midnight, boom bap, underground, hip hop shit, right? My right. core, my cloth, right? What I'm cut from. After doing Eclipse's show for like four years, 
I was like, well, for one, I'm good at radio. For two, they haven't kicked me off yet. And for three, I don't think I'm fully utilizing what Sirius XM is as a platform. And so I reached out to um, who the program at the time, Reggie Hawkins. It's like, Reg, I think it's time for me to do my own show. He was like, I believe in it 100%. Let's do it. And so I got my own show, which started weekends, Sunday mornings, early slot, moved into DJ Ski, leaving the platform and them putting me in his, um, in his time slot interim. I'm celebrating 10 years um, next month having my own show. So in total, I've been doing radio for 14 years. Now I'm on Hip Hop Nation as well as LL Cool J's Rock the Bells Radio. That came oh. about um, two years ago after working with LL and his team and interviewing LL and them just taking a liking to me. Um, you know, they extended the opportunity for me to come over there and do a show as well. So two shows on Sirius XM. One is going on 10 years. One is going on two years. And you and you enjoy the experience there. I love it. I love it. I, I can honestly say that all of the things that I do, even though it's a lot and people always ask, well, how do you do this, this and that? I genuinely enjoy everything that I do. So for me, it's never like work. It's like I get to go and put some headphones on and turn the fucking mic on and talk about hip hop and play dope songs and interview dope artists, you know, and like go see Killer Mike at the Apollo for his sound check and then go talk about it on the radio. Or right. this past weekend, I was at the vice president's residence, right, for her Hip Hop 50 concert. So I go and talk about that on the radio and I shoot content for Rock the Bells. And so, like, it's just it's just another way for me to contribute to the culture, but only by doing things that I'm really passionate about. That sounds amazing, man, to be honest. Thank you. <laughs> you know, a lot of people, I know people in the radio business, and they've had a very tough time with it. You know, they get moved around a lot. Station goes down, other station goes down. It's a tough business to navigate right. And, right. and stay in. Um, what do you tell those people? Like, what, tell me, a, a lot of people say radio, it doesn't matter like it used to. Talk to me about, the, talk to address these issues because I'm curious your thoughts on it. I do think radio matters because I still think that it's the, it's the purest platform for discovery. To, mm. Like for, 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 Everybody is not a digital uh, savant, right? People don't know how to go find, like even before it was playlisting, it was like blogs. Some people didn't know how to scour the blogs to find music and discover artists. Some people get in their car, turn their radio on and drive. And I think for that, there's still, um, I think there's still the discovery phase that happens for just your casual listener. Not like a super fan, not like a head, and not like somebody who's super digitally savvy, but just somebody who just simply wants to turn on the radio and hear some shit. And, right. you know, I look at an artist like a Coco Jones. So many people who love R&B and classic R&B love Coco Jones because they went in the car and turned on the radio and they heard a song that they liked. And maybe they shazammed it or maybe they saw the video or maybe they saw her on the award show at some, at some other point and it all connected. But that entry point usually happens at radio for your casual listener. So for that, I think it's really still important. Um, even on my show, I have a segment called uh, My Passport Stamp. So every Monday, I get a brand new record that's not in rotation. And I started. I started on my show. And then we go to social media. You like it? Tell me on Twitter. You like it? Tell me on Instagram. And it goes in the Hip Hop Nation Insta story. And for some artists, that's the very first piece of... Um, engagement that they get with the audience. And then from there, whether the record or the artist goes on to, to continue to do shit and people like, oh, I remember this cat from this, you know what I'm saying? Like just being a part of that story, that early on story, Armani White, um, who had a lot of success with the Billie Eilish record. I remember him reaching out and hitting, hitting us on, on, on satellite and having his fans message, message, message on satellite. So one day I hit him and I was like, bro, this is crazy, but you send it all of this energy to the wrong place. I was like, the programmers are going to see it. I was like, you got to start it at mix show. And so I just kind of gave him some jewels. And when I saw him, I don't know, a month ago, he was like, yo, dog, you don't even know how much that meant to me to just get your attention because it worked, but also for you to kind of drop some of those jewels on me. And so like when you have success stories like that, 
it's really dope that I'm as an artist and an MC, but I could also be a, a small part of other artists' careers. Really dope. Yeah, that, that that is a very important part. Are you pro? So do you say you have a program director, or do you picking the music? No. So I mean, radio is still a business, right? So they program right. it. Now we have okay. a dope program. I have two dope programmers, and yep. if I come with suggestions or like I said, like the segment that I have. Think he could have Ron Mills could have easily been like, no, we don't get a song a week. You know, we not, you know what I'm saying? Like that's right. important airtime, especially my day part. I'm I'm on the mornings on hip hop nation. And so, you know, every second on, on morning drive radio yeah. is really important because I'm the anchor for the day, right? right? I start the day yep. off. And so um, you know, just having dope programmers who get it, who understand, who do what is necessary, but also take risks and still go with their gut is important. We do the same thing on Rock the Bells, even though that's more for the classic artists. They have a segment called Breaking Bells, and that's new artists that's kind of cut from that classic DNA. So that's where you're going to hear maybe your terminologies or you're going to hear your Simbas or you're going to hear Rex. I'm trying to think of some of your people up there, right? Um, <laughs> Don't leave any out. Hear, There's about 200 more to go. I'm going to get called. They're going to beat me up as soon as I come to the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but you know, like just having a platform right in that space, right? So like maybe Eric B and Rock Kim goes off and then you break bells with something brand new that's cut from that same cloth, right? And you're like, oh, oh it's like static, right? We playing a static selected record with what we want it, right? And obviously we're not breaking static because he's already established, but if you if you play like some classic gangstar shit and then you go into that new static record, it doesn't stop. It doesn't, right. it doesn't break up. You know what I'm saying? Like the fear. It's not abrupt. Yeah, it's not abrupt, right? And then you go into Slick Rick or you go into NWA or some shit, right? And so it all is still very seamless. Programmers are really important in the fact that they drive what the audience is going to listen to and, and they drive what the audience is going to be conditioned to like. And so it's a, it's a very important job. And I, I'm, I'm just fortunate to have two dope programmers that don't just fucking read Spotify charts and shit. Like they still, they still go with the gut and they still go with the core. And they give me opportunity to, to utilize my skill set and bring records in as well. That's great. Yeah. My boy, Peter Parker, who's, uh, who's he's been on radio for years. He used to always say okay. that. So how, it's great all guy. about you tra how you transition it. Like he's like, yeah, it's yeah, what yeah. you put next to the song. You know what I mean? He used for to always sure. say, and I, and I agree with that, you know, as, as a music producer myself, like, Right, Seg sequencing is huge. Very um, much so. Shout out to Peter Parker. Yeah, shout out to him. Um, let's talk about the other thing. You are are you ghostwriting as well too? <laughs> um, I prefer the term songwriter, but yeah, people, you know, ghostwriting, songwriting, for all intents and purposes, the same shit. The reason I say ghostwriting is your uh, your co comrade Sky Zoo. We had this conversation about ghostwriting as well um okay you know that's kind of the term but you know not for you he was speaking for himself but um, right 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 so i'm um, guessing are you penning verses for other people that are making commercial hits is that what i'm hearing understanding yeah 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 so the the difference for me and i'm only speaking for myself in ghostwriting as opposed to songwriting is if you're a ghost right by definition you're unseen you're unheard um, me as a songwriter, I'm right in the credits of all of those number one hits. I am right yeah. in the credits on those billboard chart typing records. I'm receiving <laughs> my platinum and gold plaques because I'm listed as a writer and a publisher and I own some of that intellectual property. And so that's the difference for me. Um, again, not to speak to nobody, anybody else's business. I'm not going in and writing a verse for $5,000 and then that's it. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, I have to participate in the rest of the revenue, right? And so that means right. publishing, that means points, that means whatever that means, but that makes me a part of this record forever and not just going in and writing some shit and then being out, but but actively participating in all the ways. Like I get so many sinks um, off of records that are going into television and film, not now because of the strike, but you know, like <laughs> sinks on these records and I have to sign off on it. And I don't care how big the artist is, if we don't all agree to the terms, if it's not an MFN thing, then that doesn't go across. That doesn't happen. And so, you know, for me, that's important because I got two kids and I got to have something to leave them when I'm long gone. Good for you. Um, 
the podcast. You have your own podcast, Hard to Earn. Yes. Um, with the, I, see, the I, see, I see y'all hard to earn in the back. Very dope. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's that my a very cream. Rest the guru. That was a very, very influential album to me as a kid. Jeff's Kiss. Yes. Um, so talk to me about the Hard to Earn podcast. So Hard to Earn is myself and my partner, Bonsu Thompson, who's former editor-in-chief of The Source and uh, music for, for Double XL magazine and just a bunch of, you know, he produces and writes, got a movie coming out, story ad that he wrote. Um, just one of the top tier journalists. It came to be because of the pandemic. It's a pandemic, baby. We were both on Instagram Live. Um, me too. I think <laughs> right, I, went, I went live after like a, a versus one night. And yeah. I would have people chime in. And one day I cammed up with Bezo and we talked for an hour about verses and people loved it and people chimed in and they were like, yo, y'all gotta do this next verses. And we did mm-hmm. it for a few verses. And then when verses got a little more spur- sparse and you know, like their programming, we were like, well, we got an audience and we got a thing. Let's figure out how to cultivate it and make it our own. And so that's how Hard to Earn came to be. It's, it's us reviewing albums, classic albums, new albums, the classic albums we do on Pivotal Anniversaries. We just did uh, Lauren Hill's Miss Education 25-year anniversary live in New York City at SOBs um, with just a room full of music lovers who chimed in and told us why the song Zion is a nine and not, not a nine and a half and told us why X Factor is a 10 across the board and shit like that. So um, it's just really dope. Again, it's an extension of us music nerds and music lovers and creators and and, and journalists and people who really actively participate in the culture. Just giving the opportunity to give flowers to some classic albums and, and give flowers to some unsung heroes and just continuing to contribute, man, and, and add on to the culture. Awesome. What was your favorite verses out of all of them? Mm, great question. My favorite verses, there are a few. Um, Riza Preem was pretty dope. Yeah, it's tough to beat. Um, obviously, the locks and dip set, just like that was monumental. Yeah. yeah, so what was your thoughts on it after rolling with dip set? Are you even allowed to say? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I knew that, I knew that, I think by that point in verses, it was very much shown that you can't just depend on catalog or you can't depend on popular song in your catalog. Right. Let me say that. You can't just depend on like a hit record. You got to play these records in the right order. And if you're going to perform them, you got to deliver them in the right way. And I think that because Kiss had already had his moment in verses and he had already did the thing with Fab, he understood that. And yeah. Technician being an incredible DJ understood that. And the locks yeah. being... So in sync, they understood that. And they just went in there with a different kind of plan of attack and it worked out marvelously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So any um other, any other shit. Yeah, I mean time, like there was so many good ones. Um I love some of the the R and B shit, like uh Brandy and Monica, you know, like I'm an R and B fan as well. There's a lot of dope ones. I would have to kind of look at them on paper. Yeah. But um, yeah, there there were some great verses. For me, the one I think stood out the most was Big Daddy Kane. Besides the RZA Prem one, but that was done early on IG Live. Yeah, that so, was you know, right, sound, right, right. The sound, you know, if they had done that later and mm-hmm. under better quality, it would have been much better, you know, better thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, RZA couldn't get the equipment going. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> like, was the, Teddy, the Teddy Riley, like Teddy Riley and Keith Sweat, right? That one was like yeah, legendary. Was, yeah, yeah. I, the Big Daddy Kane KRS one was KRS one Big Daddy Kane was crazy. That, and that then it, it got like it got a little testy, right? With yeah, with, 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 with K Capri and Scratch. Yeah, that could have that that could have went real left real quick. <laughs> Big Daddy Kane caught himself. Did you see the Drink Champs recently where he explains how he amped up Scratch? I didn't watch it. I've seen clips. I said yeah. when I get when I carve out like an hour or two, I gotta check it out. Yeah, you need I think you need three hours, but um three? okay. <laughs> so he talks he talks about how he, you know, originally wanted Kane originally wanted Kid Capri the DJ for him because mm, originally okay. it was supposed to be Kane versus Rakim. I, yeah, but, I think Kid Capri said that to me. Yep. But it, and Kid Capri didn't want to do it because he wanted to get in the middle of it, right? Mm-hmm. But then the Rakim thing fell through, 
And it was then Kane was like, "Oh, let's do KRS." And then KRS asked Kid Capri to, to DJ for him, and he said yes. Crazy. So then right. Kane was like, "All right, scratch, eat, eat Kid Capri, you know, go at Kid Capri." <laughs> He picked yeah, him, you know what yeah. I mean? So it kind of, so it kind of got the ball rolling with that. But for it was, sure, for uh, sure. Uh, to me, that was just like the uh, these guys were just these guys are just such great MCs, and it was like for no sure. frills, just like stripped down. Nah, like great, great for the culture, great for the culture for sure, for yeah. sure. And so, and also it's very different too, as is type of MC as well. You mm -hmm. know, like you got like mm -hmm. this Kane, the smooth, you know, smooth mm -hmm. flow, and then you got the real explosive liveness of right, Paris. right. Right, but yeah, yeah technique, technique is different. Yeah, um, delivery, yeah, all of it. But but both like legendary, right? Both classic artists, legendary performers, incredible catalogs of music, super dope. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Talk to me about the recording cabin. What is this exactly? Because well, I didn't get much time to research this. Okay, so so here's the, this was the catalyst, right? This album that came out in 2016. This is entitled. This is my sophomore album. This album, I felt, was a perfect follow-up to For the Record, my debut. I'm super proud of this album to this day. I think it's my best body of work um, on the solo side. And so I set some goals after I made this album, after I listened back to it. I was like, although I'm an independent artist and I put this out on my own label, I want to see how far I can take this album. I want to see if I can land on Billboard somewhere. And I want to see if I can get a Grammy nomination. And so I did some research, shout out to my brother, Mac Wiles, who's actually on that project. I reached out to Mac and Reg West, and they put me in touch with some people at the Academy. And I met some people at the Academy that were really dope. And it just kind of like, it was, it was the perfect storm of all things. The Recording Academy was understanding that they desperately needed to figure out how to engage the hip hop community and R&B community better. Um, me being a New York artist, and having the relationships and the reach that I had and just my personality and it just all worked together. I met Nick, who's the senior executive director and we hit it off along with Yasmin, who was the head of membership. And I just figured out ways to insert hip hop into the conversation and they were so open to it. Um, like the first year we did a panel at Mega Evers with the Brooklyn Hip Hop Festival and just figuring out ways for the hip hop community to be seen and heard by the Recording Academy, which obviously is the organization that puts on the Grammys. It was a great time and it all just kind of parlayed into what it is now. So joining in 2016 and being active in 2017 and then becoming a governor in like 18 and then being voted vice president two terms and then voted into presidency. It's been really, really dope, but I'm super, um, I'm super adamant about making sure that I speak for the culture in those rooms, right? And so that's what the importance is for me outside of the music talk, what we do in education, um, music cares, what they do as far as giving back, uh, Grammy U, what they're doing with, with mentors and young people in the schools, Grammys on the Hill, what we advocate in and Advocacy Day, and just all of the different components that really affect the music creators, and this is not about making sure Beyonce gets paid when her song plays on the radio. Beyonce's gonna be fine, but this is about <laughs> this is about making sure that you know Dutch, right? When she's on the radio, her songs make her money because as a songwriter you get paid, but as an artist you don't. And so, like advocating or making sure, like when Rex and Term start talking about their crazy crime stories that that can't be used against them in the court of law, that's what the Rap Act is about, right? Just restoring artistic protection. And it's all shit that spoke to my heart without like getting too too far down. It's shit that spoke to my heart and, and who I am as a person. And that's really what made me stay in the academy. You're talking about the Rap Act, about lyrics being held against them. We had this conversation on my last podcast. Where are we at with that? Where does that stand as of right now? Can they still use your lyrics against you? So I wish I had the numbers right in front of me. Um, Louisiana, I, I want to say, just passed their version of the Rap Act. Um, California also passed their version of the Rap Act. And so we're just trying to get to all of the different states. Uh, in certain states, yes, they very much still can. In certain states, they can't. But we advocate and to make sure that across the board, um, that is not the only piece of evidence that they can use against you or they cannot build a case around it. Now, listen, if you're on camera and you shot somebody and you went to the studio and rapped about it, 
your dumb ass should go to jail. But if we just talking about creative expression and me looking out my window and telling you a story and maybe making it a, uh, uh, you know, right. making it creative writing in, in addition to what I'm really seeing, you shouldn't then say, oh, well, Torre talked about somebody getting shot in Coney Island, so let's bring him in for questioning. That's ridiculous. Right. It's a fine line there from the two things you just said. Oh, for sure. It's not, it's not to, and it's not for me to say, like, I want to throw people in jail, but it's right. not to, it's not to exonerate anyone who is actually guilty of committing a crime, but the, the cops and the people that are tasked with proving this fact shouldn't get an easy way out because they listen to something on, you know, the leads playlist. And now they like, Oh, well, this is all the evidence we need. Dude, I love your New England drops right now, man. You were really keeping it for <laughs> New England right now. The leads list, local rappers. You were really, you really I'm kind of good at this. I'm kind of good at this media you thing. Are, dude. You, do, I think <laughs> you, you good, you. Um, I forgot that we talked briefly about the acting. You and you in movies? What what is this? What we what are we the acting? Yeah, on? yeah. Shit, I got two movies out right now that I cannot promote because of the strike with SAG AFTRA. And, Talk and, to me about, uh, what, real quick. I don't not familiar with the strike. What is going on with the strike? Because I don't know what all the details. I mean, in a nutshell, it's it's corporate America taking advantage of the creators. It's no different than the shit that we fight against in various different forms of all of our businesses, right? But, you know, the streaming rate for rappers is shit. The streaming rate for actors is shit. You know, the writers aren't getting their fair share of what they should make, um, especially, again, once you move from the physical product and the money that you were making when you were selling DVDs and, and renting DVDs to streaming, you know, those numbers, are, there's, a, there's a big disparity in those numbers. And so uh -huh. we gotta come back to the table and figure out how people can have a fair wage and and how much money um, or how much medical coverage and insurance people can get or how many hours they can work. Or if I show up and, and shoot some shit for you that you cannot use AI to digitally recreate my presence for four other days of work and pay me for one. And so wow. it's shit like that that we fighting against, understanding where technology is going trying to be ahead of it, but also fighting for things that are already due and owed to us. Yeah, man. So, yeah. Keep, it's, fighting, it's, the good, keep fighting the good fight on that one, brother. I appreciate it. Yeah, for it. sure, man. It's it's important. It's important for, so like a guy like myself who has, we talked about this multiple streams, right? If I was right. only acting and I wasn't getting paid for these last X amount of days that the strike has been, how the fuck am I keeping my lights on, right? Even if I got a little nest egg, what happens after six months, seven months, eight months? Some people only have a year worth of savings to sustain their life. So yeah, I can go and work at McDonald's or something like that and try to go pick up a, a, a job anywhere elsewhere. But if my passion and what I've been doing and my trade is, um, it just becomes, it becomes, um, it becomes a very tumultuous time in people's lives trying to like refigure out what they've already had figured. So for me, it's like, well, I still got radio and I still got um, music that I make and I still got songwriting money that I make and I still like I still have other things that are that are that are holding me over. So even if I take a dip in one form of my revenue, right. there's still five, six other things that I can depend on. Whereas the person who's like just doing this now where they at, you know, and again, it's not about the big stars. It's about your local everyday hardworking blue collar actors and actresses and writers and everybody wow. else that that have to go to work every day to, to pay their bills. And that's the majority. That's the majority for sure. Right. Well, that's amazing, man. I'm really, I'm really happy you're doing that. Man. You Thank also you. hosted a, uh, would you host a show on revolt and BET? Is that what you also did too? So I had a short lived <laughs> um, show on revolt it was really like some man on the street shit. Um, <laughs> man on the street. It was some man on the street <laughs> shit. Like my producer um, would be like, yo, we want to shoot. So like say it's fashion week, right? In New York City, right? Yo, we want to shoot some fashion week content. So I just pop up at like the end of the Stella McCartney show and see the celebrities coming out or see the people walking the street dressed in, you know, they fashion week outfits. 
and we would we would create a show around that, right? And so from there, we would take the breaks that I did and they would program videos and, and shit like that. So that was fun. It was short-lived in that the person who brought me in um, didn't stay at Revolt very long after that. And so, you know, when, when they left, I left. Uh, BT, um, they called me in to host various things. I think the last thing I did for BT was the BET Awards in LA, maybe 20, 20 or 19 no 19 was COVID no COVID 20 was COVID so maybe 19 uh but yeah I've done like a bunch of like things for them as well you know just good times hosting using my personality and my relationships with artists and and yeah. audience and just making some good content and you're also hosting events for Rock the Bells correct yep yep so in I, addition I to love what they're doing now I, I love that station. I love the social media game is on point. I mean, they are so, killing so, it for what they're doing. I love <laughs> it. I love I love being a part of it. I mean, LL is one of my heroes. So anytime right. you can be in business with a icon and a superstar and a guy who works as hard as he does and is as true of a person as he is, is a blessing. So shout out to the whole Rock the Bells team for embracing me on the radio side. Rock the Bells brand. Uh, yeah, I've hosted at the festival radio two years. Now we do hip hop as it happens, which is on social media. So like, if you go to Rock the Bells right now, you'll see me at the White House with like Fat Joe and Remy and and or not the, the vice president's residence and Slick Rick and Dougie Fresh and, you know, Wale and like, it's just crazy. So I'm having a great time doing that. What, who's on their team? Like, how many people they got on that team over there? Because their social media publicist game is publicity game is crazy. <laughs> the stories, everything, they get the information so fast, so quick. I mean, it's like, whoa. Yeah, what yeah. Is the, the team what's is the strong. team like? What's How many team, people are over there? Team, I don't even know everybody on the team, but everyone that I've met. Yeah, the team is strong, man. Shout out to Ebony and shout out to Cody and shout out to Jay Hudson and shout out to Ack and shout out to... Marquise and I'm they not gonna send me no more free sweaters because I'm forgetting names. But the team is really, really dope. Um I'm super fortunate to be <laughs> to be a part of what LL is building on Rock the Bells. It's amazing. And it's still like outside of those people, I love the fact that so many of the artists have equity. So many of those OG artists have equity in Rock the Bells. I love the fact that Kaz and Sha Rock are on the radio on Rock the Bells and Shantae is on the radio right now on Rock the Bells, right? Like Great LL, LL is a is a superstar icon. We're not gonna act like he needs anybody or needs to do any of this shit. He can go sit in his mansion and count his millions. But he understands that if we want the culture to be represented properly, then we have to take ownership and we have to take charge and do it ourselves. And he's doing just a brilliant job at making sure that the people that need to be respected are being respected. The people that need to be employed and honored are. And like you said, like brand team is crazy. The merch is dope. He does dope collabs with artists on merch. And the, the team that does social is strong. And the, the Force Tour is crazy. I saw the Force Tour in LA. I saw it in Houston. Two totally different shows. The Roots is back in it. Tariq, Tariq is MCing throughout the night and then the artists are just popping out on stage it's seamless it's brilliant yeah they were going to do it in boston but i think they got canned um i think boston is november if i'm not mistaken did they push it back yeah i don't, yeah, I don't I think know what happened. i think it's gonna be in november it's supposed to be the end of august but hopefully i would definitely want to catch that show man yeah nah i was i think it's november for sure because i was saying if i catch another show i'll probably go up to boston for that one we're gonna really? check right now though uh oh good like straight from the straight from yeah. the source here. No, November nineteenth is the date. All right, cool. Um, I want to talk about the new album with um Marco Polo. Midnight okay. Run is that the name of it? Midnight Run. September yeah. So 22nd. did you name it? Did you name it specifically after the movie? Yes. For those who haven't seen that we movie, did. it's exceptional. Charles Grodin, <laughs> rest in peace, Robert De Niro, eighties classic. Yeah, talk to For me sure. about making the album. We want it. We wanted something that had a classic name and feel. We went through a bunch of shit. Shit wasn't sticking and making sense. And then, I don't know, I think I just like went on like a wild like Google search of like classic 80s movies and some shit. And it came up and I was like, yo, this makes sense on a couple of different levels. And I, I ran about Marco and he was with it. And, and that's the album, man. 
Uh, making the album, though, it's funny. This is this is unlike any other project that I've done before because Marco and I did not sit down on a Monday and say, hey, let's start making this album. Right. We, we had been recording these songs over a number of years, just right. recording records with my brother because he's dope on the beats and I'm dope MC. And so when I looked up, or rather when Marco called me, I was like, yo, we got eight joints. Let's put them out. I was like, oh shit, do we? And I went through the computer and I, I was like, yeah, these eight are tough. And I was like, well shit, we can't give the people eight. It's been X amount of years. Let's just knock out two more and make an album. He was like, bet. I went in, I cut two new records and we had one record that uh, we did for the Brooklyn Nets some years ago that never was officially released. And we threw that on as a bonus on the physical and that's Midnight Run. Dope. Working with Marco, what do you, what makes Marco such a great producer from your opinion? He cares. Like he, he really cares about the craft. Um, he's, he's, he's a super music nerd. He digs. And I think just his attention to detail, you know, like I'll listen to a record and I'll listen to like the final version and Marco will be like, no, this got to come up. And this like, I'm like, yeah, this shit sound dope to me. And he's like, no. <laughs> like, he's just very meticulous in the things that he's meticulous about. And then he's a scatterbrain and other shit. But he he cares about the craft. Um, he was inspired by some of the greats. He's he's going on to be their peers, but he still treats it like the kid in Toronto trying to figure it out, trying to place his first fucking beat placement. Um, and that's how he still approaches it. And and he brings the best. He's a producer in that. He knows how to bring the best out of the artist that he's working with. And he's not afraid to tell a legend, yo, do that shit again. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> those things, those things, those things that most people would be like, oh, fuck it. I got a verse for such and such. I'm just, he's like, nah, man, I think we could get it better. You know, like you need, you need those kind of assholes every once in a while because they keep this shit of ours alive. That's what people say about me. <laughs> Good guys, man. Good guys. Necessary. <laughs> Necessary. My nice asshole. Necessary <laughs> asshole. <laughs> um, anything else you want to plug in the future? Anything coming up you should be aware? I'm just super excited about Midnight Run. It's my first yeah. project in five years. Uh, it's Marco and I's first project in 14 years. So just to still have people interested in Double Barrel, the brand that we created, um, I love the music. I listen to it every day. I listen to the album every day. I can't wait until the people hear it. Um, I'm super proud of it. And this is really going to like open the floodgates to really me going back into putting out a lot more music. So I just want to get this one out to the people and, and hear the feedback and, and the criticism. But I'm already thinking about my 2024 solo album. And I'm already thinking about taking this show on the road. So it's a great time. It's a great time. I've been able to accomplish a lot since I've entered the music um, to doing a lot of the other things that were on my wish list and bucket list to working with people, to having a crazy presence, to even being a part of hit records. Because when you're an independent artist, I'm like, yo, but I know I could make this shit too. Um, but I know that it's not what my, my career calls for, but if I could lend those talents to someone else and still reap the benefits, it's just the best of both worlds. So I'm, I'm super excited just to get back to, MCing and writing my own raps and spitting crazy and body and beats and and touching down on stages and you know just kind of getting back into that space of the game. So I'm really excited for September 22nd when Midnight Run mm -hmm. touchdown. We off to the races. They said you, you. I forgot to mention your sound in the beginning was described as a new breed of raw. <laughs> Do you remember writing that? You must have wrote that. Or someone said that to you. I don't know who's I don't know who's responsible for that, but I want to fight. A new them. new breed of raw. <laughs> yeah, that's you know, a wild, I, I want to ask you something. Phrase. You said you hadn't put a record out in five years up mm -hmm. until now, right? That must have been eaten at you. I know you were doing other things, staying busy, but the core you're an MC first, and you're a musician and an artist. So to not I'll put anything you, out in five years, you must have been like. <laughs> I tell you, know you why. I mean? I'll tell you why I wasn't. It wasn't because it had become so second nature to put out a record and go through that like album cycle that it almost got boring. 
Yeah, repetitive. And, yeah, it was so repetitive and it was so mundane. I'm a I'm a true creative in that I got to stay excited about the shit that I'm doing. If it feels carbon copy or it feels like assembly line or it feels like work, then it's not as fun. And so I love that I was able to step away from music, spread my wings and do other things that invigorated me and kept me and my creative juices flowing. But I wasn't handcuffed to only putting out records because I don't think you make your best music under those circumstances. And I'm only speaking for myself. Um, you know, if that was the only way I was paying my bills, and like, shit, I got to put an album out because I got to tour because I got to make rent. That's not the way I want to create. I want to create when it's like, I got to get back because this is inspiring right. and this guy is trash and I got some shit to say and I'm ready to touch down. And so all of those things are what excites me. And that's, that's what you're getting from me now. I think the five year hiatus was necessary for me to come back with this type of energy and excitement. The other, that's dope. And the other thing I want to touch on that you said, it's like, you're writing commercial hits for people. Why, when you said, well, I can write these songs myself. Why, why someone, if you, if you're the one writing it, why aren't you as successful as that other person? What makes that other person more commercially successful than you, but you're the one writing it? Because it's, it's, it's more than the song. Like a superstar right. is is bigger than a song. You can get a right. song and somebody can and somebody can have a hit record. But right. to be a star is image and look and and promotion and personality. There's a lot of shit that comes along with it that when I decided to be an artist, I kind of shot away from all of the fancy shit, right? I never went on a major, like the most major label I've been on is Duck Down, right? Um, <laughs> I, I, that's a major. That's a duck, though. I just no, no. Of course, it's, it's it's a it's an independent major, right? But it's not like there's no million dollar marketing budget. I love it's that. Not, I love that. Yeah, like so for me, man, it was like shit. I, I think that I have the talent to create like this, even if I don't want to take all that comes along with it. Like I like walking down the block and going to the store, and somebody's yo Torre, yo, I'm a big fan. One dap. Maybe one picture, keep it moving. I don't want to get mauled and got to move in a certain way. Like maybe when I was 17, that was my dream, but I quickly got out of that shit. And so for me, it's just the opportunity to know in my mind that I could do something, set out when those, not that it's all about numbers, but when those first week numbers come back and I'm like, oh shit, I got a gold record. I'm, I'm working a gold platinum album. I got a gold single. Oh shit, we got a number one. And oh, oh shit, we got a number five. And the next week we got a number three. And oh shit, we got a number one record. I knew I could do that shit. And I could still be the, the I could still be the new breed of the raw. That's actually a good balance. I actually really like that balance almost better than if someone was just a superstar. You know, the fact that you could do both, you know, and not mm -hmm. really compromise who you actually are as a as an artist. It's like it's almost like uh, stepping into an avatar. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, the Superman <laughs> and Clark Kent shit, right? I could still like, be... There's this new fucking body of it right here, right? <laughs> Floating around could, over here. I could be Superman and I could be Clark Kent. And, and like another that. part of what my career has taken me, which is amazing, is that I've been able to forge some really dope relationships, right? Yes, like very important. Very I see LL and like, yo, talk, come in, he love and... I see Chuck D, we was at the show, and he was like, yo, I just was playing the return on my show, and or I seen Queen no. Latifah and it's love, and, or Preem calls me, and we on the phone for two hours. That shit still means the world to me, bro, because I'm right. still 23rd Street, Coney Island, Projects, Man. Carry Gone Projects. So that shit still means the world to me. I was still able to have relationships with my peers and get their respect and also make some fucking money, which is important. <laughs> <laughs> very important <laughs> we'll end on this note favorite LL Cool J album mm. favorite LL album is it's a it's probably my mm, damn Mr. Smith was tough I mean walking with a panther was tough I'm gonna go I'm gonna go mama said no 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 that's a tough one to be I'm, I'm just checking one thing. I'm going to check one thing, and it's going to oh, so give you me check. my... No, 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 no. I'm really curious your, 
your opinion on this one? He's looking at all of them right now. He's like, which one? I don't want to get this one wrong. My, <laughs> I don't want to get this one wrong. Yeah, I want to rock yeah. the bell. I'm, I'm, <laughs> Mama said, it's, I'm going Mama said knock you out. I think I think that's my Mama favorite, said. too. That was my favorite. Word, They're all word. dope, but that one, yeah. like, I think, They're was just dope. such a big moment. Yo, it was like, I mean, start right. Like, don't call the comeback, right? We got LL. He's maybe... Yeah. Yeah. falling off or yeah. you know maybe the sound is changing and he's not adapting and then right back to it hit the ground Bang. running like crazy it was just with so many dope fucking records like booming systems on there roundaway girl eat him up yeah. murder Graham, mr good ball mama said knocked out jingling five minutes of pleasure legal surge to the break of dawn Bang. mind blown emoji right like there you go fucking great album great fucking album I Really appreciate your time, Tori, and you're a busy guy, and uh, you insight, everything Man. you've given us today was amazing. Thank you. Thank you for just, like, taking me back and, and having this conversation and always, you know, early on in the artist days, booking me in shows, whether we had 100 in the room or 200 in the room, like, it's always just been nothing but love and support, and this is important to me to be able to do this shit. Hopefully, we could, we could do some more shit in the future. Definitely. I, we want to do the Leeds Edutainment versus Tore Sky Zoo. <laughs> kind of tough. That's the one That's we need. Kind of tough. That's kind of tough. I think the last time I was I was there was with Sky when we did um Battle Brothers. Battle, no, you opened up for uh Stally, I think was the last one when your last oh hour. the Stally show. I remember that. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Did, yep. Good times. Oh. Good, good time. shows. We always did good shows. So man, I'd like to thank for everybody sure. for thank, thank everybody for tuning in to Leeds Edutainment Podcast. Check us out, check out other interviews on YouTube as well as our DSPs. And thank you, Torre. We'll talk soon. Love. Speak to you soon. Peace.